Coming up on this week's show, Sonic's 30th birthday celebrations are approaching. Time Splitters 4 is announced. And we go inside LucasArts and Williams with Noah Falstein. The Retro Owl podcast is made possible each week with our wonderful friends at Bitmap Books. Now, if you're a fan of the Amiga, you've got to check out Commodore Amiga, a visual compendium, a huge 420-page book celebrating the visual style of more than 140 of the biggest titles on the platform. You can check that out and lots more on their website at bitmapbooks.co.uk. Hello and welcome to the Retro Hour podcast, episode number 277, your weekly dose of retro gaming and technology news with me, Dan Wood. Me, Ravi Abbott. And me, Joe Fox. And it is our favourite time of the week when we get together to geek out all about all things retro gaming and tech for the next hour, taking you back to those consoles and computers that we used to play as kids, those games, those companies, those magazines. We talk about everything retro on this podcast. And also, we take you behind the scenes and chat to the people that were actually involved in the creation of all our memories, really. And today, we've got an incredible guest that we'll talk about in just a moment. Um, But of course... Our crew's here to chat about everything that's been happening in the news over the last week. Hopefully Ravi's not too tired after you've just been uh, carrying a CRT TV around town for the last couple of hours. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, I, I bought one on Facebook Marketplace and it's it's quite uh, uh, quite a good place to find these like bargains Facebook Marketplace. I don't know if you guys have bought any games through there or anything. I did, funny enough, you should say that. Last month I bought a lot of, um, like a job lot of Super Nintendo games for like 100 quid. Oh, nice. Um, but the first time I've ever bought anything off Facebook Marketplace as well. So interesting that we've both kind of done it at a similar time. But yeah, I got, it was 100 quid, but I got an absolute steal. It had Turtles in Time in there and a box copy of Return of the Jedi. It also had um, Dan's favourite Rise of the Robots boxed. Um, oh, wow. For the Super Nintendo. But yeah, no, it was an absolute. I hope you put that in the bin, yeah? <laughs> no, it's gone in there's, the there, funny There's always the chance you can get mugged, but it's still quite oh, yeah. <laughs> good kind of thing. I, I got a CRT TV, like an old yeah. Panasonic one, and I, I I don't have a car, so I had to take it on the bus, and that, that was quite an adventure. But <laughs> <laughs> I could just got visions of you sat on the bus with a big smile on your face holding this CRT Yeah, TV I was. I was, like, <laughs> hugging it. And, like... Um, the thing is, no one wants to sit next to you with COVID in the area anyway, so I just put the CRT next to me and sat it on the bus like a friend. I bet people <laughs> looked at you and thought, he's probably taking that to cash converters for a fiver. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that is one thing we love to do. I mean, you know, we talk about emulation and stuff like that as well, but we love original hardware and keeping it going. And, uh, you know, there are new developments coming out all the time for classic systems. Today, we're going to be talking about new games on the Spectrum, a classic that's been ported to the Amiga as well. So we'll talk all about those very soon. And of course, every week we bring you a veteran of the video games industry. And I think the word veteran sums up, I guess, this week. Someone who's worked in the games industry for over four decades and worked at companies like uh, Milton Bradley, who of course were famous for the game Simon. Did you have one of those as a kid? Yeah, I, I remember Simon. Like, like your modern kids may have had Bop It. But, I was about um, to say, I was literally about to say, I had Bop It. Yeah. You're too young, Joe. You're so Simon. youthful, Joe. <laughs> there was always a broken Simon machine somewhere in someone's cupboard. Um, yeah, it, it was awesome. And kind of our guest is uh, amazing because he's worked for so many different companies. And, uh, you know, LucasArts Games as well. This interview, when Dan set it up, I was like, how are we going to fit everything in? It's absolutely yeah. insane. Well, this is Noah Falstein. And yeah, he worked um, at Milton Bradley because they actually had kind of a games division that, you know, he worked on video games there for a couple of years, but not really much came out of it in the end there. It was kind of around the time of, you know, other companies were coming in and they decided that, you know, that they weren't going to go down that route. But then he went to Williams. Uh, he worked with RJ Michael. One of the most famous games he did there was Sinistar. And then he was one of the first employees who joined Lucasfilm Games and uh, worked on some incredible titles there as well. Coronas Rift, and then uh, went into their adventure games, you know, stuff like um, Indiana Jones and The Fate of Atlantis. He worked with Hal Barwood on that. He also worked on Monkey Island 1 and 2. He also worked with um, RJ again at 3DO. So, I mean, he's had such an interesting career. And really, we only touch on his career from about, you know, 1980 to about 1995, in this interview, but I think we could have easily done like another two or three hours with him. The amount of stuff he's worked it's, it's on. It's mad, you know, he was saying he was there when they were working on Joust and stuff. And it's yeah. like, 
Wow, you know, that kind of legacy and then still being involved in the video games world today. And uh, he's actually got into games for health as well at the moment. So, you know, games that are helping people uh, with health that can actually be prescribed by a doctor, which is really absolutely amazing. <laughs> Give me 20 cc's of Call of Duty. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that helps. I don't, I don't think it's quite that. that yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's that's not good for the blood pressure, Jim. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I always love talking about adventure games and, you know, especially when uh, in this interview, I kind of, you know, I really get proper Monkey Island geeky with him and uh, drill him for a few details and stuff as well because, you know, Monkey Island 1 and 2 up there in my favourite video games of all time. So really enjoyed this week's interview. I think you're going to as well. Noah Falstein is our special guest and he'll be on the show in around 20 minutes from now. We're also going to be joined by Hoffman in just a moment to uh, talk about this amazing new port to the Amiga before we do. <laughs> this seems to be a bit of a trend. And we say it every week, as soon as we record an episode, a major news story lands. Um, last week, the minute we stopped recording the show, Time Splitters 4 got announced, Joe, that I know you're very excited about. I, I'm really excited about Time Splitters. We've been we've spoke about Time Splitters Rewind. We spoke about the recent yep. discovery that Time Splitters is on home front. Um, it's just so funny that you should say that. Um, <laughs> while we were loading up and everything and going through the news, I was on my phone and I've just seen Sega have just announced a new Virtual Fighter game. So Next it's happened again. New Virtual Fighter well. it's, it's happened again. So that's not made the news, unfortunately. I mean, I guess that is the news surprise. Virtual Fighter game's been announced. But yeah, the actual news that we've got is um, a new Time Splitters game that is coming to us from Deep Silver, um, who have actually, they've got Free Radical back together, haven't they? With like the veteran, the veteran designers who actually worked on the original games, haven't they? It's, it's the Nottingham crew again. The and, Nottingham uh, crew, Ravi's, yeah, old, deep, Ravi's boys. <laughs> deep, deep Silver uh, did Homefront as well. And uh, they're, they're, they've done loads of titles, actually. And they were based in the old Crytek building in yeah. Nottingham. So it's kind of like Free Radical, then went to Crytek, then... Well, the, com- the company's changed, but now they're kind of going back to their roots and bringing back one of the uh, Time Splitters games. Which is going to be awesome. Like, I think it's going to be a totally new time splitters. The whole franchise should, should be fired up once again. Yeah. So, obviously, we had the first three time splitters games, which were, you know, they came out in 2000, 2002, and 2005. And then in 2007, we were set to get time splitters four. But then, through like the change of hands and different acquisitions and stuff like that, like you said, they just didn't happen. Um, so, there's been a demand for a fourth time splitters game for 14 years. 2007 doesn't sound like 14 years ago. Like that's God. crazy. <laughs> and what what Joe do you think made the original Time Splitters so good? I think it's just the party game aspect of it. Like there's just no kind of like no barriers to what they wanted to do. They just wanted to have fun with it. And you don't get that with games these days. Games are all very serious now, you know, gun games, you know, like shooters. It was, it was like a shooters. GoldenEye engine as well, wasn't it? Yeah, it came from a lot of the guys who worked on GoldenEye and Perfect Dark and stuff. And I always remember when I was a kid playing the Time Splitters games, thinking this game feels like Perfect Dark, which and Perfect Dark feels like GoldenEye. And I never, I never knew that until, you know, I met you guys that not only was it the same people, but it was all based in the city, the bloody city I live in as well, you know, Nottingham. Uh, but yeah, Deep Silver, they, they tweeted on May 20th, you asked and we listened. We have been working on plans to bring the Time Splitters franchise back to life and are pleased to let you know that we are setting up a new Deep Silver development studio, Free Radical Designers reforming and we will be headed up by industry and Time Splitters veterans, Steve Ellis and David, is it Doak or Doak? David Doak, Doak. yeah, we've had him yeah. on the show, Dr. David Doak. So yes, this, a few times. Haven't yeah, we? so apparently it's just in the development stages. You know, we've not got any trailers or anything like that, or a trailer for the trailer. You know, like they usually do these mm. days. But it's cool. They've listened to the fans. They've listened and said, you know, we hear it. We hear people are excited when Time Splitters two. They found out, you know, you can play it in you know HD on home front and stuff like that. Let's do it. Do you know what I mean? It doesn't feel like a cash grab either. It it feels genuine. It feels like a genuine people want this game, so let's do it kind of thing. I think the fact they've got the original guys involved, I mean, yeah. if, if it was just, you know, if it was just all, oh, you know, let's put one out, they wouldn't go to that effort to do it properly. Um, and we saw last week, so I mean, you know, Ravi and I in particular know a lot of the guys who worked on it. You know, we've, we've gone to events, you know, Norway and stuff with them as well. Yeah. <laughs> we did actually send uh, a few messages to a few of the uh, team members going, do you want to come on and talk about it? Like, oh, we can't yet, guys, but when we can, we will. Yeah, yeah. So uh, as we get more details, we will. But it's just, that is the headline really, isn't it? The three radicals met together mm-hmm. and we're finally getting 
a new time splitters and game. You know, which, uh, it, it's been huge news. It's been all over the place. Like, yeah, like yeah. people are very excited about this. Yeah, we started with the biggest story here. So, uh, yeah, I knew you'd be hyped about that gem in that landing. Hyped. I think you were I hyperventilating, weren't you, with the news? It, it's another <laughs> one of those games where I'm just like, I'm still sat here like every day Googling when's the House of the Dead remake coming out because it just says 2021. <laughs> and this is going to be the thing with Time Splitters now. It's just going to be like, come in 2022 or something. I'm just going to be sat there like, just give it me now. <laughs> like... Every day will be like Christmas waiting for that news. Mm-hmm. <laughs> now let's talk about something else that we've been seeing everywhere as well. This is an amazing port, kind of following on from last week's show, actually, that we did, you know, special all about the MSX. And we mentioned that Metal Gear found its home on the MSX. That was a platform it was originally developed on. And then, again, as soon as we finish recording, it gets announced that it's been ported over to the Amiga. And this is by a good friend of ours, Hoffman. So rather than us, let's talk about it. We thought we'd get him on. You all right, Hoffman? How you doing? Yeah, good. Yeah, yeah thanks uh, for having me on. Yeah, uh, yeah, really good. Really, really good, yeah. So Metal Gear on the Amiga. How has this happened? I think probably a combination of um, of lockdown and uh, curiosity has happened here. So it started out as um, there's. I found the complete disassembly of it by a guy called uh, Manuel Pazos. Um, Spanish MSX guy, a bit of a legend in the scene. And he'd converted the game cartridge back into source code and fully commented it. It's it's quite rare to find those kind of things. <clears throat> and um, I started looking at it and was just kind of slightly curious at how the graphics worked. And then it all got a bit out of hand. And here we are now <laughs> with a full game. So, <laughs> And uh, I've, I've seen some of the features. Like, it looks mad. You, you've actually got it running at like 60 hertz as well. And it's a really <clears throat> accurate perfect conversion yeah so um the msx version kind of suffers from some slowdowns here and there and um a sprite flicker and i knew i wouldn't get away with it with the Amiga community if it if it wasn't running at full frame rate particularly seeing as there's nothing like scrolling going on or anything like that so um uh so yeah i i spent spent quite a bit of time changing all the game values to make sure that uh, everything kind of ran smoothly and um like the original but obviously without any of the slowdowns um, and obviously the uh, on the audio side because that's obviously where I I have my um, the most I could offer really. So um, yeah, I d- did a full full remix soundtrack and a complete um, set of new sound effects for the Amiga side, um, but also did an emulated MSX soundtrack. So um, as as I found out from some of the comments in this first week that um, there are some people that aren't particularly appreciative of, of the new soundtrack. Um, oh no. Uh, just because you know it's it's quite uh it's quite dear to their heart so um you know having that feature in there's just you know if, if if you don't like what i've done with it then obviously you can go back and, and make it sound like the original also we've got the um the translations in there the original japanese the original european version as well oddly enough the european original is missing like about 30 or 40 percent of the dialogue from the game they just didn't they just didn't translate it um so we ported across a um uh, a fan translation it's got all of the dialogue in it so so yes we had that in there which which is um i suppose another additional feature as well because we kind of added quite a few bits it's a new thing actually that isn't in the original game which is probably about the only thing that that is isn't um is we've got character graphics by a guy called uh, Tony Galvez, which appear when you're talking to people on the radio. It yeah. gives it kind of that Metal Gear Solid feel. Yeah, bit. yeah. It made it, yeah. it made it look more familiar for me, looking at the screenshots of it and stuff. And you've also got a Spanish translation in there as well, haven't you? Uh, yeah, that's brand new uh, Spanish yeah. translation. So that's based on the the remix uh, translation, you know, the full one, the fan mm. one. Um, and Akira did that for us. Yeah, so it's, it's like all 159 bits of dialogue have been translated. Uh, so, yeah, that was uh, uh, quite a bit of work for him and uh, not quite so much work for me. So, <laughs> <laughs> And what, what's the reaction been like? Because I know it's kind of out now and uh, I've seen lots of people playing it on Twitch and it's just kind of out there and uh, lots of excitement about it. Yeah, it's been it's been really really kind of weird but really exciting at the same time the the reaction mostly um i'll be honest has been really really positive it's it's an interesting title to pick actually because what with it being on the msx a lot of the amiga community have, have either they may have heard of it obviously may have obviously heard of the newer versions of the games but um have most likely not played the msx version so it was quite a good one to pick because it kind of brings it to a, a, a wider audience that may never have played it before. 
Well, Hoffman, it's always great to see, you know, arcade quality ports to the Amiga, and especially this as well, because, I mean, I do know that it was once kind of advertised to come out on the Amiga, you know, it came out on the NES, the C64, but the Amiga version never arrived until, you know, 2021 when you guys have done it, so that's incredible. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's pretty pretty crazy. I, I, yeah, I found that advert about uh, halfway through the production, actually, which is quite interesting. I was trying to see if I could... Uh, see what the uh what the amiga version looked like but the uh the the picture is 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 pretty grainy so but yes it's, <laughs> it's 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 as close as it physically can be i think and it's free to download as well oh uh, yeah completely free um uh, there is a link um to, it's on my blog i think it's hoffman.home.blog um just go there um there's a link straight at the top that says metal gear amiga port and you can download it there There'll be a version 1.1 1. 1, uh, popping out um, probably end of this weekend, just with a couple of minor bug fixes here and there. But um, uh, as it stands, you can, you know, as long as you've got your Amiga configured correctly, you you'll be able to play that end to end with no issues. I think that's my bank holiday weekend sorted. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Thank you, Hoffman. Appreciate you coming on, mate. Brilliant. Thanks for having me. Now, some more big news, of course. I can't believe we're getting close to this. It only feels like five minutes ago that we were talking about Sonic's 25th anniversary. And this year, Sonic the Hedgehog turns 30. I believe it's on June 21st. I know it's going to be different in different countries, but I I could be wrong. He's got to start slowing down now he's hitting 30. (laughs) (laughs) I've slowed right down now. I'm in my 30s. I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to lie. But yeah, 30 years of Sonic, man. And there's a lot of Sonic stuff going on. You know, we've Mm. got the second Sonic film coming out. You know, the first Sonic film was the was the biggest film of 2020, wasn't it? Just because of the pandemic. <laughs> yeah, not not like, that there was much else out, to be fair. Yeah. There wasn't much else out, but it did, it did. It was the biggest film of 2020. But yeah, there's a lot of Sonic going on. And Ravi's favourite thing is always the rumour mill with Sega. You know, oh, every, gotcha. every week there's something with Sega, another rumour, and Ravi's like, I'm sick of talking about Sega rumours. Bloody Dreamcast 2. You watch your Dreamcast 2 get announced the minute we stop recording today. <laughs> yeah, yeah <that'll> exactly. <laughs> exactly. But yeah, there's, there's unfortunately, it's all rumours at the moment, but there's a few rumours going around of something coming for Sonic's 30th anniversary. I think it was on um, the French Amazon. Uh, there was a, a listing for... Um, a Sonic collection, 30th anniversary collection. And yep. the rumour is it's either going to be a Sonic Colors remaster. I've never played Sonic Colors. I don't even know if that's... Oh, re- really? Yeah, I don't game. even know if that's really? like a big one for Sonic. Um, yeah, it was on the Wii, wasn't it? Yeah, I think it was on the Wii yeah. or a potential yeah. re-release of Sonic 3 and Knuckles together, you know, where they actually... You can actually play a digital version of the games when they're connected rather than getting Sonic 3 and then Sonic and Knuckles separate. Because that always annoys me that there doesn't seem to be a version where you could play them like they were on the hardware, you know, where you connect them together. You know, the 25th anniversary, they did quite a lot of stuff for and they got really excited about it. So the 30th, they've got to make a huge deal of this and there's got to be games released and, you know, it it can't just go with a whimper. This this is the big one, you know. Do you remember the live stream they did for the 25th anniversary, though? It was the most cringeworthy thing I've ever seen. I don't, but I keep seeing things saying it was really cringe, but I don't remember it. (laughs) There was, um, it started and they had a guy dressed in a Sonic um, costume, of course. dancing to these DJs Brilliant. who were like just stood still next to him. Really awkward. They had some like dodgy bands on as well. The microphone kept just the sound didn't work through like about a quarter of it. It was a bit of a disaster. But of course, at that we did get the announcement of um, Sonic Mania. Mm. There you so go. that was yeah. how the good thing yeah. that came out of that. So oh, there you go. Sonic Mania really. When did Sonic Mania come out? It got announced. Yeah, five years ago. It came out um, twenty seventeen. Oh yeah, wow! So, wow, it yeah. took me that long to play it. I only played it this year, didn't I? <laughs> yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah, Sorry, I'll play Sonic Colors next. <laughs> yeah, but this—I mean, it does make sense that you know Sega are bound to do something mm. to celebrate the 30th anniversary. I mean, again, I think you know releasing a collection is a good idea. A lot of people are kind of saying that, and I, I've been seeing this everywhere. That you know, how many times have we all bought Sonic One and Two? You know, I must—I'm not even kidding when I say I probably bought that around 10, 15 times on different systems. I have four copies of Sonic Two on the Mega Drive alone. Like yeah. not not like you know four copies across like the Xbox 360, the Xbox One. I have four physical copies of Sonic. 2. I, I went like, mad on on Sonic CD because I didn't have Sonic CD on any of a system. So I think I bought that about four times and oh, played yeah. that to I, death. Because have it, it on like the iPhone brand and new everything. Game, you know? Yeah, yeah. That's crazy. So I remember the, um, I've got the, you know, the Sonic Gems collection, I think it was. It was where Sonic CD was on the GameCube, wasn't it? Was it was a great collection is, of yeah. that. that yeah. the, funny enough, in a lot of the articles I'm reading, they're saying 
that's what they think. That's the kind of the rumor that there's going to be a, a, a Sonic collection coming out for the 30th anniversary, you know, in the same vein of the Sonic Gems collection, because that was the last kind of really good collection where you got like Sonic and Knuckles, Sonic 1, 2, and 3. You got like all the Game Gear ones on there as well, as well as Sonic. Yeah. Like you say, you got Sonic CD. It was the first kind of like easy way to play Sonic CD, that version was, wasn't it? Yeah, we didn't need a Mega CD. Yeah. Um, and also, it'd be nice to see, you know, Sonic Adventure 1 and 2 in there as well. Yeah, I'd, I'd be really down with that, you know. And those games are becoming increasingly more expensive, you know. Sonic Sonic Adventure 2 is, you know, it's getting up there now. So seeing like a new re-release of that, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't sniff at that at all. I wouldn't turn my nose up to that at all. And I wonder if, you know, like we've mentioned before, if there's going to be like, you know, Sonic the movie video game announced to a check. <laughs> I, must admit, I am quite hesitant to um, kind of predict what that's going to be like, but Sonic, it's, got, it's got to happen. Come on. Sonic the movie, the Sonic the video game by the director. <laughs> it's like the, the King Kong game, how it's called like Peter Jackson's King Kong, the, the video game of the movie. <laughs> 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 but I mean, they might do something like they did last time. So they also announced um, Sonic Boom Rise of Lyric at the 25th one, which was, I think, you know, Sonic Boom. So, so one. one good game and one <laughs> yeah. Bad game. Yeah. So maybe there'll be one for like the fans, you know, maybe like a new kind of, you know, 16 bit kind of spin off or, or maybe a collection. Joe will get his Sonic Adventure follow up finally. Yeah, yeah Sonic so Adventure uh, 3. Bring it. I demand it. It does feel like since Sonic Mania, though, Sega have been a bit more kind of in tune with what the fans want. Yeah. Um, even though that wasn't obviously developed by Sonic Team. Uh, but yeah, so it'll be interesting to see. Like you said, if it's only about a month to wait, obviously we'll uh, we'll keep an eye on that and keep you updated as we hear more. Now, this looked pretty cool, Ravi. You spotted this. A new driving game is coming out for the Spectrum featuring some classic cars. Now, this is made by a team in Russia. Yeah, so so this looks absolutely insane. It's for the uh, 128K. So it's, it's not for the Spectrum Next or anything like that. It will run on the Spectrum Next, but... Uh, the design of the game looks absolutely insane. It really, really good quality. Um, it's by a company. Let's try and say this. Zosia, 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 Zosia Entertainment, and uh, they've released like four other titles before. So Bonnie and Clyde, Drift, Just a Gal, and uh, Valley of Rains. And Drift looks like it kind of had the same type of graphics and the same type of engine. And uh, these are all Scandinavian cars as well that are in it right. and uh some of the models like i remember from my youth going around and seeing the kind of oval windowed beetles and, and stuff like joe won't remember these <laughs> these are all the cars that you'd hear going down the road really really loud and uh just the graphics on this it it, it just looks absolutely fantastic what, what do you think dan like for for a spectrum game Oh, this is absolutely stunning for a Spectrum game. I mean, obviously, it's um, there's not many colours because, you know, the spec you couldn't do a lot of colours on screen. But the detail of them is just insane. You know, the, the way they're drawn and it even looks a lot, you know, high resolution than I remember most Spectrum games have been. They've even got stuff like cutscenes in here. Yeah, cut which, scenes. Which, you know, for a Spectrum like, game is insane. <laughs> you know, you go off the track and you're hitting all the road signs and stuff and there's, like, elements that are getting hit. You're right, cut scenes... You can be a motorcyclist as well. They've got different stages, so like weather. With they've got lights on the cars. Winter, you know, it, it just looks absolutely mental. And they've got the whole different genre of um, like characters as well. And I just think the, the the way that the artwork's done on it is absolutely beautiful. It's 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 just. I haven't I haven't seen a Spectrum game like this. Uh, my knowledge isn't that big on Spectrum games, but I'm already in love with this title. Yeah, and I think again, it's you know we, we've talked about this on the show before. The fact that you get these people who grew up with these machines really learned the hardware inside out, and now all these years later are doing things with these you know 80s computers that we couldn't have dreamed of when they were on the on the shelves back in the day. Yeah, and, and it comes it comes with with an audio t- uh, as a uh, audio tape with copies of the game on it so you know it's tape loaded and amazingly you get a cd as well so you get a cd soundtrack and a data cd but well, so um, you can blast the music while you're playing it as if yeah it's yeah but also nice. <laughs> also you can get a data cd that has like all the stuff on there as well um the tap image a uh, tape and uh you know like the manual and stuff but um it's it's pretty cool having it on cassette as well. 
I love the fact that it's um, come from Russia as well, because, you know, we often regard the Spectrum as just being like a, a British phenomenon back in the day, but it was actually really big over there, mainly because of the clones. Yeah, systems there was that they lots had of uh, Soviet Spectrum clones, weren't they, that, that ended yeah. up, and uh, there's quite a big, I think there's a big Russian Dizzy community, and there's a big uh, Russian Specky community in general, but uh, awesome to see that there's a new company kind of producing titles and already having, you know, four under their belt. Yeah, so this game, it's called um, Travel Through Time Volume 1, Northern Lights. So I'll put a link to that and everything else we talk about in our show notes at theretrohour.com. Speaking of great fan projects as well, seems to be a lot of them around at the moment. Uh, This one looks ambitious. Someone's trying to recreate Counter-Strike on the Nintendo DS. So yeah, this, this somebody is trying to port it from the ground up. It's a French YouTuber called Funity, I believe that is his name. And essentially he's He's making Counter-Strike from the ground up on the Nitro engine for the DS. Now, don't get me wrong. I I, I know Counter-Strike's an older game now. It came out in 2000. And obviously the DS came out, what, in 2004 or something like that. But the power of the DS compared to the power of, you know, computers that we had in 2000 and the stuff that you need to run Counter-Strike I, I, it's crazy that he's, you know, it, it looks like Counter-Strike and he's got it running and he's got it aiming and, you know, he's shooting and running about on it uh, and, on on the legendary map, the iconic map, Dust 2. Yeah, and this isn't this isn't like Counter-Strike Source. So when yeah. Counter-Strike came out, it was kind of that and Half-Life really established yeah. Steam. Like, Steam was kind of not much of a platform until until they came out and everybody started playing on them. And, uh, yeah. you know, it's, it required big PCs with 3D graphics cards and stuff. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And, like, looking at some of the titles that have come out for the DS, um, I, I remember Payback was one, which was 3D. Um, oh, was there Grand Theft Auto? Um, yeah, there was some Call, Call of Duty Wars games on there as well. Yeah, there? yeah, there was a few. Yeah, Chinatown Wars and a few of the Call of Duty games on the DS and the PSP and stuff like that. But I think what's equally impressive is he's got it working with the stylus, with the touchscreen as well. Yeah, that's that's oh, awesome. Wow. But, yeah. but it's not also just a tech demo of uh, kind of just running around on your own. He's he's managing to get bots in there, which, yeah. is, which is really important. And he seems to be using this engine called the Nitro engine, yeah, uh, which seems to be a 3D engine for the DS, which... It's just wicked to see because maybe we'll see more 3D titles getting onto it. Like it's I, I, I do love that the bots, hardware. Is I do it? love yeah. that the bots at the moment are little Minecraft characters. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 you can skin them. But and also this map dust is like one of the most legendary maps. Yeah, like we have Min Lee on the podcast who who created Counter Strike and um, dust was so popular that an artist actually recreated the dust map in real life in Germany, like with full boxes, <laughs> you know, kind of like the, the whole map. So getting uh, dust two on there is just like a huge, huge deal. I'm just waiting for the, you know, the guy who's made it, he's put, I think I will publish the game and source code later. So he's going to put the game on the a game and server. So I would love to see like a LAN party of people playing this on their DSs, like all just but crowded if, if around it. If he's done it right, then there could be skins. There could be, yeah. like, obviously with the Minecraft skins, there could be like mad multiplayer modes because there's stuff like Catch of the Flag and knife matches. You could just play knife chucking on your DS. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, you know. You know, I'm wondering if, because um, I'm looking at the YouTube video and I've always found, I mean, I've never really played any FPS games on the DS. Um, I always find them a bit fiddly with the D-pad. I wonder if it supports the um, the analog stick on the 3DS. That's interesting, actually, because in the videos, yeah. he has got a 3DS hooked up in the background, you know, like right. you know, to all the computers and stuff he's doing. So I imagine, yes, I can't see why not. That oh. would make it an easier way to play it, I yeah. think. I just love yeah. those stretch textures. <laughs> um, does, does it have a gyroscope in it or a, like a... Uh, I don't think so. No, that that would be funny, wouldn't it, if you could just run around by moving <laughs> it in the direction. Yeah, but the, the fact that he's managed to get this, you know, what was a high-end PC game, like you said, Joe, just a few years before the DS came out, um, running him, the, the frame rate looks pretty good, actually, you know, I think he's yeah, done a yeah. good job so far. He's done a good um, job. Obviously, it's not quite ready f- to be released yet, but um, we'll keep an eye on that, and if you want to get hold of it, I'll link up the article in Nintendo Life in our show notes, along with everything else at theretrohour.com. 
Now, Joe, I know you've had a long day at work. It's six o'clock in the evening. Why don't you crack open a beer? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Let me just have a little sip. That was a big sip. That was a really, really big sip. <laughs> it was a big sip. <laughs> the, the, feel refreshed? I do gone. feel refreshed. I do feel refreshed from my beer 52. I do feel very refreshed. <laughs> Well, let's give a big thank you to uh, this week's sponsor. It is our mates at Beer 52. Now, they are the world's largest craft beer discovery club with over 170,000 active members. And each month, they send you a case with a different theme. Now, um, we want to give you a free case of eight beers. And they do so many different things as well. Now, you also get a magazine with it um, called ferment magazine actually until you read this you don't realize how interesting beer actually is yeah you just yeah i i'm not a big beer drinker and this has been quite interesting to me like usually you know i'm, I'm just not a big it's not that i'm not into, I'm not into beer or anything i'm just not a big drinker at all but this has been really cool like it just having it delivered to my door like opening it up it felt a little bit like christmas like I sat on the floor in the front room while my wife sat on the edge of the couch watching me like unwrap them. And I was like, oh, look at this one. Oh, I've got a raspberry pie, OT milk beer. Oh, I've got an IPA. Oh, I've got a fuzzy, fuzzy IPA. <laughs> like usually I'd go for something citrusy, but you know, I've got a coffee beer, which I'm looking forward to trying a coconut beer, you know, really, really interesting. And I love that you mentioned then, because I mean, obviously they send different boxes out mm. every month. The one we've got here, though, there is actually yeah a raspberry pie, raspberry oat milkshake pale ale. There's actually, it is the raspberry pie computer. Yeah, it's the raspberry pie yeah. computer and all the artwork's like all pixelated on it and stuff as well. That's amazing. And I was just like, I wonder if they purposely sent that one to us. <laughs> <laughs> but I, what I love about Beer 52 is, I mean, you get eight beers mm through your door um and also it encourages you to try different things as well doesn't it and you know they do themes from all around the world and what's really good is you can customize it to your taste as well so if you don't like dark beer you can choose a light options you know vice versa you get the ferment magazine as well and also when you're having a beer you need a snack as well they include a tasty snack and um, the one i've got here is that uh, roasted chickpeas jalapeno and cheese that's flavor. the one i got that does sound i wolfed them sound down nice. they were very nice <laughs> So listen, why don't you treat yourself to a case of eight beers on us? Now, you can pause or cancel at any time. Obviously, it comes with the magazine, the snacks as well. All you need to do is pay the £5.95 postage to get all this delivered to you. So nip onto this website right now, beer52.com slash retro. Use our link so they know that we sent you. And of course, you'll be really helping out the podcast by doing this. Get yourself a free case of eight beers and a snack. Enjoy the bank holiday weekend and uh, just pay that £5.95 postage. You get it all delivered right now, beer52.com slash retro. And a big thanks to our friends at Beer52 for their support of the Retro Hour podcast. Now, why don't we mention a gaming shop? We've been doing this recently, haven't we? Celebrating gaming shops around the world. Yeah, um, we've been getting some emails and, you know, like... We, we really need to support these places. Like, gaming shops are a very special thing. You know, we, we have record shops still going, and they had a lot of support. So I think we need to put our focus in on gaming shops. So if you guys could contact Show at the Retro Hour and let us know about your local independent gaming shop and why it's so good, uh, we'll give it a shout on the podcast. And this week, we have Power Up Gaming, which is uh, from Canada. It's in Barry on... Terrio, am I saying that correctly? <laughs> I think you are. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and this is from uh, one of our patrons, Peter. He suggested this one. Yeah, yeah. He's he's contacted us and he says, uh, my local, there's one in my town of Barrie, Ontario, Canada, and it's called Power Up Gaming. They have a great selection from all generations and a very beautiful shop and the staff all make you feel really welcome. So I've got some photos here, guys, if you if you want to. Which we're looking through now. I love their tagline, reviving the past to captivate the future. I feel like they've That's like, nice. and I know you've just grabbed these photos like off their Instagram or something, but it feels very aimed at us. They've got an out of this world display, aka another world display where they've got like the SNES version, the Sega CD version, the Switch version. Like you say, they do all sorts of games and I'm also just, you know, drooling at all the Star Wars games they've got as well. Like, you know, and I I, I really love going into actual retro game shops and just, you know, going for the hunt and actually looking at what they've got in person rather than sitting there online. 
This is definitely aimed at you, Joe. They've actually got a Mary Kate and Ashley crush course. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, place. no, I, I need that on PS One as well. So I'm going to jump down to Canada and get like, jump up to Canada and get that. <laughs> well, it's also interesting to see because they've got an online store, so it's PowerUpGaming.ca, and like some of the stuff that they're stuck in there, they've got like three DO, um, Jaguar in television, Coleco, Gold Star three DO. A Neo Geo, Philips CDI. Oh, wow. Um, so, you know, there's lots of different systems in Canada that, that we wouldn't have over here or that weren't so popular that they seem to be listing, as well as stuff like Game Gear and uh, Sega CD. So check these guys out. Now, Noah Falstein coming up, some stories about Williams and LucasArts in just a moment. Just time to quickly mention our wonderful patrons. Of course, we are a completely independent podcast. That's a reason that we can talk about, you know, new games being released for the Spectrum and Time Splitters 4, and we can bring you incredible guests. We haven't got companies over our heads going, you know, you need to be more mainstream, you need to cover this. We do the show, it's just three guys who love retro video games, who put our heart and soul into bringing you the show each week. And that, that is thanks to our wonderful patrons. Yeah, man, I'm absolutely blown away by the amount of people who actually support us. You know, we were really worried when we first set it up that it was just going to kind of like fall on its face and... It would have been a little yeah. bit like with the pandemic, what do we do with recording and, you know, being separated now and stuff like that. But, you know, it's been going over a year now and we've consistently, you know, people have been really consistent with it. And we're a seven away from 200 supporters on Patreon now, which is just blowing my mind that 193 people, you know, are supporting us, you know, financially, which is just absolutely amazing. So and if we could get to 200, you know, it'd be absolutely amazing. And, and like Dan said, it's only a couple of quid a month as well, just to keep the running of the show going for us. You know what? Do you reckon we can hit 200 patrons by the time next week's show comes out? Maybe. I thought I thought you were going to say like on, the next Feel month confident. or something. But I, I'd just be happy to see 200. I don't want to put like, you know, we've got to see it by the end of the week. I just, I, I'm, ha- I'm happy either way, man, that we're getting supported. But yeah, it definitely keeps the show going for real. Well, obviously, you know, supporting the show is a great reason to do it. You know, the fact that you're keeping the show coming out every single Friday. But, you know, we give back as well. What, what do patrons get, Joe? Well, they can get a number of things. It depends which one you go for, but they can get the show early. We've actually started recording the show on Tuesdays rather than Wednesdays so that we can actually get it out to the patrons a couple of days early. They get an ad-free episode as well. Uh, we've also recently incorporated an extra Patreon-only um story as well in the news segment so rather than getting the ads they get an extra news story you also get the google hangouts which we do once a month which are really really fun where we don't necessarily talk about retro games we talk about anything and everything and you know a little bit more of a community um so we do the google hangout every month we also do uh, they get access to the discord as well um and then also uh, you can get t-shirts all sorts really um, I'm like, and the after hours podcast, the, after, yeah. the, the main thing really is the after hours. Yeah, you also get access to our. I knew there was something big. You get access to our <laughs> second podcast, which is called the After Hours, uh, which you know is really meant to be a kind of behind the scenes. Um, but we've kind of been picking topics and talking about them, like different, you know, my life in gaming for the that particular year, like the year 2000, and we've just done um, an episode dedicated completely. It's one of our favourite consoles, the Sega Mega Drive, and our memories of the Mega Drive and favourite games, haven't we? Joe, shine you your element there. Episode. Oh, I don't know about shine, but I had some funny stories. <laughs> stories that we couldn't put out on the main podcast. Yeah, but yeah that way, absolutely. So. <laughs> so if you do want to get access to all that, and of course, make sure that you're keeping the Retro Hour podcast coming out every single Friday. It's all thanks to you. Give us a little back on Patreon. We'd really appreciate it. Like Joe said, he knows the cost of a cup of coffee once a month it's you know not much at all and of course for doing that you will get a mention in the most prestigious high score table in the world of retro gaming the retro hour hall of fame like this week thank you jeff bell ford kill larson christopher bolton lee mintram and ryan brooks who all backed us on Patreon. We massively appreciate your support. And if you'd like to do the same, you'll find all the details on our website at theretrohour.com. Right then, let's welcome on our amazing guest this week, getting some stories from the earliest days of video games, going right through to Williams and then LucasArts, those amazing adventure games. Noah Falstein is our special guest, and he's next on the Retro Hour podcast. You're 
listening to the Retro Hour podcast and it is time to welcome on our very special guest, always our favourite part of the show, when we welcome on an industry veteran onto the show. And today we're going to be going behind the scenes of one of our favourite companies ever and getting some stories from, uh, well, Lucasfilm Games as it was originally, LucasArts later on, and lots more as well with our guest this week. Welcome to the show, Noah Falstein. Hello, Noah. Hello, glad to be here. Really appreciate you joining us now. Um, we can't wait to get some stories um, from your time at LucasArts and these many other companies that you work for as well. I know you're at 3DO. Um, companies that we've touched on with, um, people I know you know well and um, other peers in the industry, but it's going to be great to get your take on it and your stories too. We also like to kind of find out your credentials as well from like day one. I mean, do you remember kind of what initially got you into computers and where your journey all began? Sure. Well, I mean, it, it's it's uh, interesting because my initial exposure to computers was when I was in, uh, let's see, I think seventh or eighth grade. And it was pretty negative because this was way back in the uh, early 1970s. So it was all Fortran and punch cards. And I had been a science fiction fan as long as I can remember and thought computers would be these marvelous things. You know, I thought we'd pretty much, you know, get right to where we are today back then. And uh, realizing that using the computer to do my math homework was possible, but it took maybe 10 times longer to, you know, type out punch cards and run them through a deck and wait for some mainframe to chug through all this stuff. And it was way faster just doing it by hand. So uh, it really wasn't until college that I discovered computer games. And that's kind of what got me hooked on computers as a, a fun thing to do. So what what got you interested in programming and what kind of languages were you looking at? I, you know, early on, I, you know, as I said, some of the, it was uh, the kind of stuff that was available at the time was Fortran and basic. And uh, it really was pretty difficult. Um, but I went to a, a college, uh, I guess uh, you, you would say university, a place called Hampshire College in Western Massachusetts that uh, was and still is a fairly experimental place that lets you plan your own curriculum. And uh, my first semester there, I was taking a calculus class and our, our teacher strongly recommended anybody interested in math uh, should learn computer programming and recommended a, an after hours class taught by a student. And I thought, well, it sounds good. And that was uh, in a language called APL, which is pretty much obsolete at this point. But it's actually a really creative and fun language, very set up for math in particular, but turned out to be a great language to make computer games in. And the student teaching the class, you know, an up, upper level student, taught us some of the basics the first uh, night. And I remember he said, oh, you can leave if you want, but I've got some really fun games on this mainframe that we we work on. And that was all it took to get me going. Uh, it was, a, I think, a Star Trek game. Uh, it turned out to be written by Don Daglow. Uh, I don't know if you've had him on your your uh, yeah. podcast yet, but um, Don, uh, you know, got started earlier than I did. And a lot of us in those days, there were just so few people doing it. Uh, we all got to know each other at one point or another. But that's what really got me hooked. And APL was my primary language. But through my years at, at college, I was learning all of the kind of popular higher level languages at the time, like um, Pascal and Lisp, and uh, also starting to learn assembly language and how to do even down to machine language and flip switches to turn ones on and zeros off. So uh, very low level stuff at the time, but great training for you know a career uh, starting in engineering. Well, how did you make the move into the industry professionally? So at school, my senior project, uh, they, they, you would do these very big detailed senior projects at Hampshire. And I was the first one to propose doing a computer game. And none of my professors had any idea what went into them. This was in, oh, would have been 79, I think, when I proposed that. And uh, ended up doing a game about mining the asteroid belt. And eventually I wanted to add combat, but that proved to, to be more complex than I thought. But I had a, a pretty involved uh, graphic asteroid mining game going on, uh, only ran on one terminal that the college had because most of their terminals were text only, and I used one that could do graphics. 
And uh, that caught the attention of one of my professors who had been moonlighting at Milton Bradley, which was about 20 miles down the road from where I went to college. And he knew that they were expanding an advanced research division uh, just about the time I was graduating in early 1980. And so I followed up based on his recommendations. And then as now, anybody with some pretty decent coding chops, you know, was uh, a hot commodity and it was quite easy to actually get a job. And uh, it never occurred to me right up until the time that I got that first job that there was actually a, a career in making computer games. Uh, but, you know, once I heard that it was a possibility, I was all for it. Well, you worked at Milton Bradley, like you mentioned, and uh, there was a famous game, Simon. <laughs> I, I remember that. Everybody everybody used to play Simon. Tell us about your time working there. Yeah, well, Simon was, in fact, the, the crux of it all because that had come out a few years earlier and made them a lot of money. It totally surprised them because I think it was the very first, certainly the first successful electronic game they made. And it's amazing to me. It uh, the TV show Silicon Valley prominently featured Simon just a couple of years ago. It's, it's had a, a great longevity. And they made so much money off of that, they decided to open up uh, both a software group and a research group. And they uh, asked me to, to come into the research group where they were trying new things. And it was a really great experience um, in all ways but one. Uh, I got to to uh, meet a lot of great people, uh, some folks I'm still friends with today. I worked on speech synthesis and recognition games at first and motor control for robots and all sorts of stuff. But if that sounds surprising, it's because in the two and a half years I was there, uh, I think every project except one that our group did was canceled before it went out the door. And uh, they just didn't have the confidence that they could really go all in on this new computer stuff. And they kept backing off at right up at the edge. There was a Milton Bradley home computer that was uh, about two months from being launched when one of our rivals, Coleco, came out with the Atom computer that had virtually identical specs. And they said, yeah, if they're out two, with a two-month head start, no way we can do that. So lots of stuff got canceled along the way, but it was a tremendous learning experience. That must have been frustrating, was it, after you know putting all the effort into these projects? Yeah, yeah, but you know, as I'm sure you've you've heard, uh, most people in the games industry, certainly anybody that sticks a long time, if unless you're extraordinarily lucky, you work on a lot of games that never make it to the light of day or mm. that are launched and three weeks later shut down because they can't get a, enough of an initial traction. So it was a, a bit of a brutal time, and it was the main reason I wanted to leave there. I just uh, in fact, the, the, our whole advanced research division pretty much emptied out over the course of about a year because people just got fed up for not having their, their uh, work published. Well, the first game people might know you from is Sinister. Um, that, that was released by Williams. How did your journey take you from Milton Bradley to, um, to Williams then? So uh, the arcade industry was, I think, the hottest thing at the time. This would have been uh, 82 and they had the best hardware. They were, you know, having uh, custom systems that had more RAM than any of the home computers. Uh, the Atari VCS, and I, I worked on a couple of games for that at Milton Bradley, also never published. Uh, but that was the the big console, at least in the U.S. those days, uh, also called the 2600. And I was looking at a lot of different possibilities, came close to accepting a job with a branch of Atari that was in uh, New York City at the time. Uh, but I grew up in Chicago, and Williams and several other pinball companies uh, had gotten into video games, uh, interviewed at Bally, and uh, there were several others in that area. And the combination of getting back and seeing some of my friends from high school, and uh, you know, my, my parents were very happy about the idea of having me uh, closer to home for a while. So that really made it work. And Williams, I just, I love the quality of the work they did. Uh, when I joined, they had already um, launched, you know, some of their classic games like uh, Stargate and Defender and Robotron. And uh, they were just finishing up Joust when I was there. I, I got to do some testing work on that before it went out the door. So it was just a, a opportunity too good to pass up. So that was what brought me back to Williams. 
And Sinistar, um, the, the man, uh, John Newcomer, who was their lead designer, in fact, he was their only full-time designer, he had come up with the idea for Joust and uh, had a concept for something called Juggernaut that had kind of stalled out. But they thought that I might be a good person to come in and take over the project and get it done. And that's how Sinistar uh, came about. Um, you know, I, I became the project leader. I worked with uh, Sam Dicker, who had been the lead programmer and who, in fact, did do most of the code that, that went into the final game uh, for the operating system underneath it. And uh, had you know assembled a team of people, and uh, you know it was my first published uh, professional game, so it was a, a big deal for me. And as I know, you've you've also talked to uh, R.J. Michael. Uh, I actually brought him into the games industry to work on Sinistar. He was our our junior member of the team at the time, and uh, he and I have remained friends, you know, in all those years since then. You also joined Lucasfilm Games very early on, and that was uh, in 1984. How did you start working there and what was the kind of initial aims of that games department? Yeah, well, Williams was a great company, but the first year I was there was wonderful. The second year was when the the big crash came in the arcade market. And uh, once again, you know, just as it happened to Milton Bradley, most of the people uh, were either uh, laid off or, um, you know, saw the handwriting on the wall and, and left pretty quickly. And uh, I had uh, heard about Lucasfilm Games because a friend of mine had interviewed there and had used me as a reference. And she didn't get the job, but I was fascinated that Lucasfilm was actually planning on making games. They had yet to release the first two when I started talking to them. And everyone knew about them. You know, the Star Wars movies, the, the first set were just legendary. And in fact, uh, when I was talking to them, the uh, Return of the Jedi was, was I think, just about coming out and, you know, really peak of their early popularity and uh, absolute dream as a place to work. And the thought that they were going to make video games was amazing. So I just, uh, you know, jumped on that chance, came out to California, did some interviews. Uh, my sister and brother had both been living in different parts of California, and I knew what a, a great location it was. And that was enough to get me going. Uh, the the kind of quality of the work that they were doing, their their first few first two games, uh, Rescue on Fractalus and Ball Blazer, just blew me away. It, it just they were doing things that nobody else uh, thought was even possible on uh, the early Atari computers at the time. And uh, the chance to go out and work there was it was you know just a dream come true. Most of us there were hardcore Star Wars fans and couldn't believe our luck at actually working on video games for a company like that. And I know the department had close ties with Atari at first, didn't it? Was that kind of the aim to be like a, a creator of Atari games then? Was that Lucasfilm Games mission at first? It wasn't so much the mission as an opportunity that uh, one of the things I've learned from you know working with a, a number of you know people who later became billionaires is that part of their trick is using other people's money. And rather than using the money that he had made from Star Wars, uh, George Lucas was able to get uh, a million dollar investment from Atari. And a million dollars in the early 80s went a really long way for video game development. So uh, at first, he gave us this this little mantra that we uh, all you know took to heart of uh, stay small, be the best, and don't lose any money. He didn't care whether we were profitable. He just hoped we could break even. And with that million dollars to start with, there was a lot of room there. And originally, it was a deal to make games released uh, exclusively for Atari. But very quickly after I joined there, um, Atari got sold off to the uh, Tremils, and there was a lot of disruption, and there were delays in releasing those first two titles. And in that process, new deals were struck, and the uh, division, the well, division, the, the games group that was part of the Lucasfilm Computer Division, uh, kind of moved on from there, and we became first uh, the Lucasfilm Games division within Lucasfilm, and then uh, LucasArts Entertainment as as it uh, grew larger and larger. What were you initially working on there? Well, I was a great uh, amount of freedom there. They brought me in 
and showed me what they were doing, you know, with those first two titles and said, yeah, we'd like you to be one of the people to make some of our, our next generation titles after these and pretty much gave me free reign. Uh, so I brainstormed a lot. It was a extremely collaborative group. Uh, all of us who worked there, I, you know, really appreciated the fact that we, we enjoyed, you know, leaning on each other's uh, uh, specialties and, and strengths. And I was very fascinated by Rescue on Fractalus and the idea of a space game. And the whole Fractal engine had a better quality for 3D gaming than anyone else really at that time in the, the mid 80s. So I wanted to make a game that was similar and that's how I ended up making a Coronas Rift that used the Fractal engine but brought it down onto the ground uh, so you could drive tanks around in a science fiction landscape. And it was a lot of fun, but it was, you know, looking back at it, it was still me learning how to be a good game developer. And uh, there are so many things I would do differently about the design and the, the direction we did. And yet, you know, we did okay. Uh, people appreciated the games we were doing. And as we worked on it, our group expanded. I, I was uh, either the seventh or eighth employee, depending on how you were counting. And by the time I left there eight years later, I think we were up to about 150 people and it, it went over uh, three or 400 at its heyday. So it was a, a great time to start small and see it expand. And after a while, instead of not losing any money, we realized we could actually be profitable and, and make a fair amount of money too. So uh, that worked out pretty well. Did you see Coronas Rift as a sequel to Rescue on Fractalus then? Not specifically. Uh, David and I talked about that as a possibility. In fact, he had originally wanted to have Rescue be a Star Wars game, but uh, a lot of other companies had been given licenses to do video games based on Star Wars, and we weren't able to do that at first. So he made a, a fresh original story that easily could have fit into the Star Wars universe if you you know just change things a bit. And I took it a step further and made up my own science fiction uh, universe. And it was similar, again, to what David was doing, but uh, it wasn't really meant to strictly be a sequel. Uh, certainly, it was kind of a spiritual successor in that if you liked Rescue on Fractalus, um, going around shooting aliens and, uh, you know, exploring new worlds, it was very similar that way, but that's as far as it went. When did the focus kind of shift onto adventure games? Well, it never completely shifted there. We always did a, a variety of different types of games, uh, but gradually from, oh, 86, 87 uh, to 90 or so, there was more and more of a sense that the adventure games became our flagship uh, projects. I also helped start uh, what was originally a, a naval simulation line, and then we did uh, World War II flight simulators. I uh, brought on a guy named Larry Holland, who, whom I worked with on a number of projects. And those, Larry eventually did the X-Wing and TIE Fighter games. So that was a, a constant stream of you know, non-adventure games that were, were going on there. And there were quite a few other interesting, you know, smaller games that had been done on, on the side as we were going through those. But um, the progression really was we did a game based on the movie Labyrinth that was a, a Lucasfilm movie, but wasn't our core Indiana Jones and Star Wars. Uh, and then Ron Gilbert uh, came in. I had actually brought him to be a, our Commodore 64 programmer on Coronas Rift. And uh, he obviously proved to be a, a great acquisition and did Maniac Mansion, which really kind of set the stage and created the, the uh, scum engine we used to do all of those uh, story games. And with an engine that we could build on, quickly, uh, most of us pivoted and wanted to do you know some of these adventure games that could uh, do that you know David Fox after working on Labyrinth uh, which was kind of a, a prototype for for Maniac Mansion in some ways but then he did Zach McCracken um, Ron and David and I collaborated on Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade Ron went on to do the first two Monkey Island games uh I did uh, Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis with Hal Barwood. Uh, we brought in uh, Brian Moriarty, who did Loom. So a lot of that stuff started blooming. All that was from, uh, I think, mid-80s to 
1990 or so, 90, 92, I guess. And uh, we were working, you know, by that time, the company was putting out four or five different games a year. And uh, maybe two of them were adventure games and the other two were in different areas. You mentioned Labyrinth, and that was quite a cutting edge game. I remember, you know, that had like a, a word wheel instead of, you know, most adventure games before that were text passes. So, you know, you'd actually type in the commands. Was it like a, a real effort to not kind of go down the route of the user having to type things in and actually make these games easier to play in that regard? Uh, yeah, absolutely. We all had played the text games and uh, many of us were big fans of Infocom and their text adventures, but we really disliked parsers because it felt like you were constantly having to outguess what kind of words they wanted you to use. And even the flexible ones, it just felt like an awkward interface and, you know, typing on the computer it just wasn't as cool as, as being able to point and click. We felt uh, that really felt like the, the future. Uh, you realize that around, I guess it was 1984 when uh, Apple uh, with, you know, started their Macintosh line and really popularized the use of a mouse. And we, we didn't have a mouse on the computers we were working with at that exact time, but we could see that that was the future. And uh, also one of our biggest rivals, uh, Sierra, that was um, always uh, doing better than us financially in the U.S. Uh, so we, we kind of specialized in doing better in Europe. But we felt that a lot of their early games that were parser based were particularly frustrating because it not only made you guess the words of the, the parser, but then killed you off if you did the wrong thing. And, you know, we were just looking for ways. And I think Ron was really our spiritual leader there in, in trying to lead the charge to just make a better quality of game. Uh, not so much for adventure games per se, but really for interactive storytelling and to try and figure out what that new medium really was all about. And that was one thing I really appreciated about Lucas um, film games, the fact that you couldn't, in most of the games, you couldn't actually, there was no like permadeath. There'd always be a way around it, you know, because it was nothing more frustrating than playing text adventures and just taking a wrong turn and then you're completely dead and had to start the game all over again. You know, first couple of times it might have been amusing, but after a while it just got boring, didn't it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the whole idea of a story where you're constantly dying off and having to start again, uh, particularly the ones where you go back to a saved game and uh, my my biggest pet peeve is that there are there were at that time a small handful of games that you know totally uh, disrupted reality in in pretty disturbing ways. You know, for example, you if you didn't pick up some item in the first few scenes of a game, you could get almost to the end and then find out, oh, sorry, you need to not just reload a save game, but basically play again from the beginning because you didn't pick up the right item. And it just, yeah. you know, uh, it, it, it was for some of us, so we were under the gun in that our players were demanding 20 to 40 hours of gameplay. And it was really hard to pack that much entertainment time into the game. But forcing you to start over and redo it again and again uh, through frustration just felt to us to be the wrong way to do that. So, you know, that, hence the, the uh, kind of manifesto that, that Ron spearheaded of not eliminating completely having player death, but it, turning it into something where you knew for sure, you know, if there's a, a button at the bottom of a swimming pool that is going to set off a nuclear explosion with you at the center, you could probably pretty much tell that this was not a safe thing to do. <laughs> yeah, because I remember playing games like Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy and like, you know, literally smashing my head off the keyboard after I played it for about <laughs> half an hour. <laughs> yeah, the, the Babble Fish puzzle in that one uh, yeah. <laughs> was infamous for years. Well, I mean, around this time, it sounds like a really exciting place to be at Skywalker Ranch. When I mean, you mentioned those early days, you know, just working there was incredible. But when it kind of got up and running, when we get to around, you know, 87, 88, what was kind of the day-to-day the -day atmosphere like there? And what was it like working in the center of all that? Well, our group moved to Skywalker Ranch in, I think, uh, mid-86, somewhere around there. And it was just uh, a fantasy land. Uh, you know, it was... George spent at that point about a hundred million, I think, of what he'd made on the Star Wars films to build this this incredible facility out in the hills in, in Marin County. And 
it had he had this this uh, world class chef who'd been trained at the the Cordon Bleu who would make lunches that were subsidized by the company. So we would pay something like three or four dollars for this multi course lunch that would have been you know at least a twenty or thirty dollar restaurant lunch back in those days and you know easily more than that now. The there were movie stars and uh, recording artists and people coming through all the time and beautiful places to sit and work. Uh, there was a little pool out, a pool, a pond out there with a, a raft. And, you know, one day I, I put a, um, you know, pen and paper in a plastic bag, swam out to the raft and tried to do some brainstorming, you know, sunning on the raft. Uh, that was, that was, you know, not very successful, frankly, but it was still a fun thing to try. But yeah, it was just an amazing place. And, you know, just one quick flash forward to give you an anecdote. Many years later in, um, let's say, 2013, I got uh, the job as uh, chief game designer at Google. And the, our first day at Google, there was a bus where uh, the literally the th- 300 of us uh, who started that, that week at Google uh, were, were put on buses to get a tour of the campus. And the person next to me just was just blown away. We, you know, we were really amazed at, at Google and what it was like. But I said, wow, can you imagine working at a cooler place than this? And I just smiled because I was thinking, well, yeah, kind of been there, done that. But <laughs> yeah, this is pretty nice, too. I, I appreciate it. You're right. It's kind of pioneering because you look at all the tech companies now like Google and Apple and they've all got their own big campuses that with free lunches and all this kind of top chefs and stuff. It's it's yeah. uh, really interesting to hear about that. Um, you were working on loads of titles for the C64 as well. Uh, was that your kind of preferred platform? No, I actually preferred the Atari, uh, particularly for the you know color space. The uh, Atari had... Um, 128 colors uh, on the VCS, and I think they they flipped another bit and made a 256 on on the uh, Atari 800. Whereas the Commodore 64 had 16 colors, and they're pretty badly chosen. You know, really a lot of ugly colors in that small palette. But it was more popular. It cost less, and uh, was very well marketed. And so we started to shift over to that and. Within a year or two of Commodore 64 being a big platform for us, the IBM PC started to actually become a good gaming platform as they added better graphics cards and sound cards. So by the oh, late 80s, we were finding most of our sales were on the IBM compatibles, but we also kept experimenting. Uh, my friend RJ, who came out uh, to California almost the same time I did, he went to Amiga and worked on the Amiga computer, and we loved that as a game machine. But likewise, you know, with the Commodore, they they had trouble getting enough people to buy them to to make a big enough installed base for us. I always thought it was a real testament to the incredible programmers that you had. The fact that you got you know stuff like the Scum Engine running on the the Commodore sixty four and the Apple II, and even the NES, I know, you know, oh, yeah. getting it running on those limited machines, it just blows my mind that you managed it. We had we had a great team, uh, Chip Morningstar, who doesn't get a lot of um, press because he was kind of a behind-the-scenes guy. He was hired immediately after me. We, we shared an office for quite a few uh, years, and he uh, is still, to this day, one of the most brilliant programmers I've ever worked with. He did not only uh, the Scum Engine with Ron, uh, Ron had never understood how, you know, never known how to make a, uh, an interpreter before a compiler. And uh, Chip had done it a number of times and you know, showed him how, how it was possible. Chip was working on uh, simultaneously with a lot of this stuff, a uh, project called Habitat that uh, also got released as Club Carib. It was the very first um, massively multiplayer uh, game, uh, it, it, you know, basically environment. Massive in that day meant only about 300 people playing. But this was a Commodore 64, uh, one megahertz processor, 300 baud modem, you know, just a glacially slow modem. And he had a game where 300 people were playing in the same environment, you know, not all on the screen at once, but incredibly groundbreaking, you know, years before Ultima Online and the others that became much more successful came out. And all those folks that did, you know, Ultima and EverQuest and the early ones uh, knew that that Habitat was an inspiration and, uh, you know, really fun to see all that working. But yeah, we had some 
some great programmers. We had, of course, the uh, esprit de corps of knowing that we were working for this famous movie company and uh, you know, going to SIGGRAPH. Our game group wasn't well known, but the, the uh, graphics group at Lucasfilm that was doing all the special effects for the movies were the stars of the show. And it was uh, very heady days to, to just feel that we were having to live up to the uh, quality that they were putting into the, the movies and the early computer graphics they were doing there. Well, speaking of very talented people you worked alongside, obviously Hal Barwood on um, Indiana Jones and the Fight of Atlantis. Um, you worked with him on that. And obviously that game was a massive hit, not only one of the most fondly remembered Lucasfilm games, but also you know, just in general, probably up there in the, the top 10 adventure games of all time. What memories have you got of working on that title? Well, it certainly was in many ways, you know, one of the, the most enjoyable projects I worked on uh, because Hal and I hit it off so well. Um, he came on fresh out of the movie industry and it just amazed us that somebody would voluntarily give, an, give up being a successful screenwriter, producer, director to work on video games when so many of us imagined maybe one day we'd work in the movie industry. And, but Hal, like a lot of other folks uh, there, had seen that there was a future in combining interactivity and film storytelling. And yet Hal had, he had done some uh, personal projects and games, but he'd never done a professional game. So they paired the two of us to work on a new Indiana Jones title. And he taught me immense amounts about storytelling and filmmaking and camera position, all that sort of stuff. And in return, I helped guide a lot of our interactive uh, structure. And for Fate of Atlantis, it was great fun working together. We've, we've since collaborated on, uh, oh, four or five other titles together and, uh, you know, remain in close touch. He's actually gone on to a third career. He's now, I think, on his seventh or eighth novel. I just decided, you know, to quit computer games and write books. So uh, he's a role model for me. You know, I... I don't ever expect to have as many different careers as he has, but uh, I love the fact that he's, you know, 80, 80 years old now and still, uh, you know, turning out a lot of creative work. But uh, yeah, Fate of Atlantis, just to say one bit more about that, really fun collaboration. We pushed each other. It was uh, a really enjoyable project to work on, and I'm super gratified at how well it's been received. And you know, even to this day, uh, a lot of people are are studying it or playing it, and uh, you know, holds up pretty well, uh, considering the the limitations of the time. No, I felt like the company was on a real roll then in terms of, you know, all these hit games coming out and, the, you know, they're getting better with every title. And obviously they had a massive hit in 1990 with The Secret of Monkey Island. Again, you know, another game that's up there in the best adventure games of all time. And I know you did design work on the game. Um, what was working with Ron Gilbert like and any memories that stand out from Monkey Island? Yeah, well, Ron and I have, I think partly because we kind of grew our expertise together, uh, I, I feel like I can brainstorm better with him than pretty much anyone else that I've ever worked with. Uh, you know, he came in for the Coronas Rift game and uh, I, it was a very collaborative environment. We were all kind of packed together. So even though I wasn't a major player in uh, Maniac Mansion, I would look over his shoulder. He would see the work, you know, that I was doing and, you know, we were always commenting. And so with uh, the Monkey Island games, I, I got a little more involved uh, just because I loved where it was going creatively. And the thing I'm, I'm proudest of, uh, although Ron didn't really remember uh, the origin that way, but uh, I have very clear memories of suggesting the insult sword fighting uh, mechanic because, uh, well, it's a long story that I've published and talked about uh, other places, but ultimately we needed a way to have some kind of pirate sword fighting and realized that we needed something different for uh, such a, a comic-based game as as uh, The Secret of Monkey Island. And I didn't come up with the insults that were used, but uh, the original mechanic was something that was started by an inspiration from uh, all of the pirate movies and the Errol Flynn movies and in particular, the Princess Bride film that Ron had everybody watch as a prelude to brainstorming sessions on that first uh, Secret of Monkey Island game. 
And that was just a genius mechanic as well. I mean, even to this day, you know, when <laughs> my brother and I are talking, sometimes it'll just come out with, you know, how appropriate you fight like a cow. <laughs> it's something that's just like stuck in our memories, you know, for decades since. Yeah, it was. So one um, memory I think I uh, can give you a working with Ron is that the team that, that worked on, uh, I guess it was probably Monkey Island 2 that this came in on, but there were a bunch of people uh, from the team, you know, specifically uh, Dave Grossman and... Uh, Tim Schaefer, who were, you know, Ron's closest uh, accomplices on that, uh, but also Steve Purcell, I remember, was in the room, and everybody was laughing uproariously in the next room. So I came in, and I said, "What's going on?" He says, "Well, listen to this. So they're out there, and they find a boat, and there's nobody on it but a crew of chimps." And everyone in the room just started laughing uproariously, and I gave him this kind of weird stare. It's like. So it's a crew of chimps. Yeah. And they all started laughing again. And I said, what's so funny about finding a crew of chimps? And it was like, oh, you know, and they, they just didn't have a good answer for me. And it wasn't that I, I you know, I, I think, frankly, I just threw cold water on it and I still feel a little guilty about it. But they went back and reexamined it. And even though there was there were elements of that that made it into the story, it was one of those cases where I, I'm afraid I, I, you know, took the air out of uh, a, a totally different direction for the game. But everyone was constantly kind of sticking our noses in other people's games, and often the the building that we were in at Skywalker Ranch was uh, in a storybook for the ranch that George had had come up with in his mind. Our our building was the stable where the horses had been kept. Uh, and there was a water trough in the center of the building in an open courtyard. And that watering trough was kind of our meeting place where going back and forth from one half of the building to another, so many conversations started out in that open area. And we would often come up with great ideas for the games, just chatting openly, uh, you know, and people would come in and hear what was talking. People were talking about and join in. Others would, you know, look at their watches and head back and get some work done. But that was really the kind of collegiate atmosphere. And, you know, everybody was always helping each other out and making suggestions and sometimes getting into really heated arguments about uh, which direction a game should go. You see, I know a lot of us, obviously, I mean, with the way the world's been over the last year in particular, have been working remotely, but it's when you get situations like that, you know, where people are all together and you can just brainstorm it really to show what a difference that can make, though. Absolutely. Uh, in fact, there's a, a kind of a genetic line from Lucasfilm in the earliest days to uh, all the spinoff companies and uh, Pixar was started as the... Um, graphics group of the computer division, and we were the games group of the computer division. So we worked with a lot of those folks. You know, I mentioned Lauren Carpenter, and he's been a senior scientist for Pixar for many years. Uh, but they built, you know, with Steve Jobs uh, at, in, in, at Command, this campus that structurally was in some ways very reminiscent of Skywalker Ranch and had lots of gathering places where people were encouraged to kind of stop and talk to each other. And uh, I've since worked with people who are ex-Pixar, and even they are carrying on some of these traditions. So you get these these company cultures that last for decades, if not longer. Yeah, it's creative people all together um, exchanging ideas. And was that game like a changing point for Lucasfilm Games and when Monkey Island came out? Because obviously it was a huge hit. I wouldn't say particularly so. It was... It was a huge hit and we were very proud of it, but there was always a sense of looking forward at, you know, what are we going to do next to top it? Uh, in fact, Ron, after the second Monkey Island game, went, you know, left the company to form Humongous Entertainment and, you know, strike out on his own uh, within LucasArts. Uh, and I was only there for another year or so after Ron left. Uh, we were always looking at, at newer and better games. Uh, I was working on The Dig in its earliest stages, and we wanted to do something original there that was based on an idea from uh, Steven Spielberg. There always was this sense that we could do better, and we were really pushing ourselves and competing with each other, you know, obviously cooperatively, but also with all of the other companies out there. We were keenly aware 
going to, at that point, the uh, consumer electronic shows that were being held twice a year. And we would meet all the people who are our rivals and then get in, you know, have a few drinks and, and basically trade all of our techniques with each other just to see whether, uh, you know, confident that we could top what we did and kind of boast about how clever we'd been in our, our uh, work that we'd done. I know that you were credited as um goofy pun consultant on Monkey Island 2. And I remember playing that game, you know, on my, I think I played that on a single floppy drive, Amiga 500. And mm-hmm. it came on around, I think it's about 13 discs or something. <laughs> yeah. So there's a lot of discs. It was a big game. I mean, it, it just kind of felt like, you know, you went all out on that game and like, it was just like an epic adventure. I mean, did, was that kind of the, the aim then to make this like a something really big over the previous game? Oh, well, actually that, it, it almost was the opposite in that that was one of the fastest turnarounds that we ever had. Uh, you know, I remember very specifically that there was a one year development uh, plan and uh, our last crusade game had come out faster than that, but only by having three of our most senior people work on it at once uh, with the second secret of monkey Island game. Ron had a lot of ideas that he hadn't been able to put into the first one and the team was intact. The engine was already there, but with uh, a few improvements and modifications and um, it got big, I think mostly just because we were starting to learn how to do more and more. And it's also partly fueled because, as I mentioned, we were starting to do games on the PC, which had uh, multiple times the amount of memory of the Commodore. And I think we gave up on the Commodore by then. Uh, but even the Amiga was was kind of struggling to keep up with the expansion side of, of the PC and, you know, bigger disks and, you know, more RAM so that we could just do more and more with the game. It was always a, a technological arms race with all our platforms and uh, elements of the platforms that, you know, even with one PC, there were like four different sound cards available. It was just a, kind of a, a mess in those days. Yeah, I mean, I, I did enjoy the third game as well, Curse of Monkey Island. I know that was after Ron left, and it did kind of feel like, so obviously, Monkey Island 2 finished on a cliffhanger. And, you know, I, I think all us Monkey Island fans would love Ron to actually finally do his sequel one day, you know, whether that'll happen or not. I know he's kind of been campaigning a bit for it. Yeah, you know, he and I brainstormed, on um, you know, right from the very beginning. I, I have to say, I think I'm one of the very few people besides Ron who knows what he had in mind when he called it the secret of monkey island and he has been very careful never to give out what that actual secret was because it's not really apparent in in the the first couple of games um but in fact a part of his plan for the third game was to base it on what the original secret of monkey island was all about so i would love to see him do he's been calling it version 2a i think uh in in his postings and i I, it's very unlikely disney is ever going to you know release that but uh it would be pretty spectacular if he did Oh yeah, that that yeah, miracles can happen. Fingers crossed. <laughs> it also kind of felt like Pirates of the Caribbean was like the Monkey Island movie, though. It felt like they'd played that game and just took all the ideas from yeah, it. Yeah, you know, there's there's hot you know debate about that, but frankly, what convinced me that there was a strong influence is uh, the scene in Monkey Island where you're uh, crossing the swamp to meet the Voodoo Woman there's a very particular type of music that we did and an atmosphere we were building. And it was so similar when they had a a scene like that in the, the Pirates of the Caribbean movie. And despite both being based on the ride, of course, it just, there, there were a number of things that I felt had to have been at least inspired on some level by, by the games there. But given that we're all freely borrowing from, you know, each other's source material, I think it's all, all fair, uh, you know, in the end. Well, how did you get involved with the 3DO and, uh, what was it like working with RJ again? Yeah. So what happened is, um, in, uh, early 92, uh, financially, we were having a bit of a slump, you know, as a, a, a group, and there was a pretty significant uh, layoff. And I was kind of shocked to be one of the people caught in it, probably one of the most senior people laid off. And uh, it, it was, you know, long story, the, the people that laid us off themselves, most of them left the company within a few months after that. So I think it was kind of a, a last ditch effort to, to you know, 
strengthen their own positions. But uh, for whatever reason, it was a shock to me. It was uh, pretty devastating at first, but happily, there were so many interesting things going on in the industry that uh, within a matter of, of weeks of that, RJ, who I remained close to, told me that he was working on this top secret new project and he wanted me to interview for it. And my interview was uh, directly with Trip Hawkins, who is still the head of EA, which was the biggest video game company at the time. And, you know, I had met uh, Trip because some of the naval simulations I had done had actually been published by EA. Uh, and so we, we spent a lot of time working with them. And uh, he wasn't able to tell, wasn't able, he wasn't willing to tell me too much about what was going on, although RJ had, had hinted so much that I knew I wanted to be involved. And uh, yeah, I became their ninth employee. And for the first six months, I was the entire production department uh, reporting directly to Trip on that. And you know, then we started to expand rapidly. But the dreams for the 3DO, I think the best way to put it now is that we thought at that point in uh, the early 90s that we were going to do something that really wasn't achieved until I think the first or even the second Xbox came out. But at the time, we were very hopeful that we were going to have a box that uh, was just the platform of the future. And it was groundbreaking in a lot of ways, but uh, for many reasons, it, it didn't really work out that well financially. But the, the one consumer electronics show where we debuted it for the first time, it was literally the talk of the show. I, I found that I could wander around this huge show with, uh, I think, 70 or 80,000 people there and listen randomly to conversations on the second day. And roughly half of them, the people were talking about this new 3DO thing. And have you seen it? And, oh, it was amazing. And I don't know if it's going to work. Oh, it's just great. It's going to have to work. And it was a, a huge rush to be you know, part of something that was, was so groundbreaking at the time. Yeah, because people forget, I mean, that was, you think of that era when they came out in 93. I mean, we were literally just gone from the, the Sega Genesis and the Super Nintendo into the 3DO that had CD-ROM, it had, you know, full screen, full motion video. It really did felt like, you know, not just jumping one generation, but about two or three at least, I think. Yeah, you know, they were very hopeful that they could fit entire movies on CDs. Uh, and DVDs were already in the works at that time, but they, there weren't DVD players out yet and certainly not attached to game machines. And they got within a factor of two of compression, but they could only fit about an hour of, of decent video onto a, a CD rather than a DVD. And that just wasn't good enough, you know, having to, to swap discs in the middle of a movie. They just didn't think people would stand for it. And, and that was a good call. But if we had just been able to squeeze a little bit more and the 3DO had turned out to be the first uh, platform where you could play full length movies on a disc, then I think we would have really uh, taken over the world. But, you know, it just wasn't quite there yet. Well, what did you think of? 3DO as a concept then, because I know it was kind of meant to be like, uh, almost like VHS, you know, any company could make it and it, it'd be like a ubiquitous console platform. Were you expecting it to be a success? Did you think that was a good idea? It seemed pretty reasonable. Uh, so Trip had uh, been the marketing, the head of marketing at Apple and studied directly under Steve Jobs and really picked up part of his, um, what they would call a personal reality distortion field. That so that when Trip was talking and when he was really on his game and and you know giving you a pitch, you could believe almost anything. You know, Jobs would would do that to sell the, the next generation of so many products at Apple. For Trip, he would with 3DO, he would just convince us all that this was going to be the biggest thing ever. And in fact, the name 3DO was specifically chosen to sound kind of like video. Um, because he wanted it to be that kind of generic thing that many different platforms would use. And it was a great idea, except for the fact that uh, the companies that he worked with priced it so high because they weren't making any money off of the software like all the other uh, console uh, game companies before and frankly pretty much after were were you know had a lock on the platform and were able to to skim money off of the, uh, software. I mean, that's what Apple is is uh, having a lawsuit on, you know, even as we speak. Um, but with uh, 3DO, he envisioned it to be more like a VHS 
uh, tape standard, and there were multiple companies making VHS videotapes. So it was really a great idea from a business standpoint, except he didn't quite have the clout to get those hardware companies to keep their prices low enough to make it work. And the 3DO was, uh, for its time, adjusted for inflation, the second most expensive game console of all time. Uh, the, the Neo Geo is the only one that cost more in the dollars of its time. And it was just too expensive for most people to uh, buy in large quantities. That and a year after it came out, the first Sony PlayStation came out and Sony uh, took it as a loss leader and undercut uh, the 3DO price considerably. You know, I do wonder as well if, if 3DO had been a big success and kind of become the you know ubiquitous gaming standard, whether that would have kind of um, stagnated hardware development as well, whether it would have gone, you know, as quickly as it did or whether, you know, if it became like VHS, whether people would have just stayed with it, you know, for like a decade or more. I, you know, it's a good question. My sense is mm. that there's so much competition in the market then and now that it probably would have been usurped by someone else, or at least there would have had to be a, a new generation that would be much more powerful. Well, you were credited in uh, Thimbleweed Park, and that was just a fantastic game. I, I loved playing that and uh, completed it. It felt like a kind of LucasArts adventure as well. Did you Did you enjoy that title? Yeah, yeah, I didn't do a lot on that. I appreciated the credit, but you know, one of the things I've loved is that those folks I worked with at Lucasfilm, we have continued to collaborate. Uh, David Fox has, you know, been one of my closest friends since then, and uh, you know, we uh, see each other, you know, very frequently. Um, and that was part of what happened that uh, he was developing, you know, his part of the game in uh, Marin in California, Ron was in Seattle, but since they were collaborating and I was talking to both of them, they invited me to do play testing and be uh, somewhat involved. And of course, Thimbleweed Park really brought a whole bunch of people back together. Um, you know, one of my favorites, favorite additions was uh, they got Boris Schneider, who uh, was basically a, a kid doing our German translation back in the 80s and is now a higher up at, um, it was at IBM, I think, uh, in Germany. And yet he came back to do the, the translation for this just to be part of the team again. So yeah, Thimbleweed Park was a lot of fun of recapturing some of the fun of making the game as well as uh, for the people who played it that way. Well, have you noticed a kind of revival of interest in adventure games over the last few years? Certainly, I, you know, the low point was probably around 10, 15 years ago when uh, adventure games had pretty much faded. And even though there were always some diehards creating them, it felt like it was a total niche uh, that, that was only for hobbyists. And they have made something of a comeback. Uh, also, the indie game field that's grown so well, a lot of those people love the early adventure games and have taken them to the next level with, you know, so many different interesting games out there. Uh, you know, games like um, Gone Home, I think, you know, was a, a, an interesting idea that was clearly inspired by a lot of the early uh, graphic adventures, but took it in some new directions. Uh, so yeah, it's been great for me to see that. And I love the fact that the variety in games is better now than it's ever been in history. And doesn't seem to to be letting up. You know, there are new genres and niches being invented and discovered, uh, you know, pretty much every month. Well, no, it kind of feels like we've only, you know, scratched the surface of your incredible career over the last hour. I think we could do like another five hours with you easily. But just kind of, you know, moving it forward to today, what, what are you working on these days? Are you still involved in games? Sure. Oh, uh, quite a bit. Um, and I've, I've moved more and more into consulting. Uh, I've been a freelancer for most of my career now. Uh, a lot of the, the games I've worked on since uh, LucasArts and then DreamWorks Interactive have been independent. But these days I work primarily in uh, one of these new niches, uh, Games for Health. Um, I had a hand in uh, the creation of, of a game, for example, that uh, is called uh, Endeavor RX. That is the first video game that was ever cleared by the FDA to treat uh, a disease. Uh, it, it basically is meant for treating pediatric ADHD and doctors now have to prescribe it. It's like a prescription medication and has shown to be uh, roughly equivalent in, in effectiveness to things like Adderall or Ritalin with much more uh, benign side effects. 
And I love the oh, fact wow. that games are now actually being used to to treat diseases and to help people in, in this brand new way. Absolutely, very worthwhile um, work there. Really appreciate you uh, sharing your stories with us as well, Nora, over the last hour. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. So I uh, thank you very much for coming on and being our guest. Thank you very much. It's been a lot of fun.